and I hit 7 on mine. It looks like we just went live on my uh, little indicator on my video deck here. Welcome to the RV Repair Club. Go live, our question and answer for June. My name is Dave Solberg, the managing editor of the RV Repair Club. And it's been a month since we have done this, and quite a bit has happened over the course of that month. Summer is uh, tomorrow, I guess, uh, um, already, and we've had the campgrounds are filling up. Everybody's getting excited, and I see tons of motorhomes and travel trailers hitting the road back and forth uh, in our area here. Of course, we're very close to Winnebago Industries, about 20 miles away, and so we have a lot of motorhomes that are pulling out from storage and coming back to Four City to take the plant tours and so forth. So with that, let's get started. We do have uh, three questions that have come in. The first one is from Pam, and she has a 2018 Fleetwood Bounder, and we have recently been experiencing continuous blown fuses for our right turn signal as well as our undercarriage blue light. As soon as we replace it, it blows again. What causes this and can we fix it ourselves? Well, if it's 2018, I would believe that it's, it should still be under warranty. Uh, that is something I would definitely get in touch with your dealer to have them at least document it so that if it goes into further issues down the line, causes some other damage, um, then you want to make sure that they are aware of it, that it was done during the warranty time or close to the warranty time. What's causing that is you have an automotive style fuse for those turn signals and, and undercarriage lights, I'm assuming. And it's just a very uh, small little two-prong plug-in style, same thing that you would see in a truck or an automobile um, in your fuse panel. And it is going to be a 5 amp or a 10 amp or a 15 amp, probably with lights like that. It's probably going to be a very small, uh, low voltage, or not low voltage, but low amp, probably a 5 amp fuse. The first thing I would do is I would check to make sure you've got the proper fuse in that fuse box. Um, don't just go by color, but you should actually have a, f a pattern a diagram that says what each individual fuse is for. And normally you don't have a left and a right uh, turn signal fuse. You have just a, a one fuse that covers both of them. But if the left one is doing it, then that's, there's something in that wiring system, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. But make sure that you have the proper size fuse. If it says 10 amp uh, on, on the block of the diagram and you put a 5 amp fuse in, chances are if there's some other stuff um, that's tied into that, and they're both on at the same time, then it's going to blow. You also don't want to go too high. You don't want to put a 15 amp fuse or a 20 amp fuse in there because then you're going to start melting the wiring. So check with the fuse the first thing. The next thing I would do is check with your left turn signal bulb. Um, in 2018, you, you might even have LED bulbs in there, but it's, it's not uncommon to get corrosion in those, and even with a new model like this, uh, if you've got some kind of a pinhole or a little bit of a crack, you get moisture in there, and then that moisture is going to short out. Uh, so basically, the way this, the, the light bulb is going to work, or the turn signal is going to work, you've got a flashing module somewhere that's going to open and close, open and close uh, power going to your light bulb. But your light bulb is going to have one negative or ground point and one positive point. If you get moisture in that socket, or the socket goes bad, and those touch, that's what's going to blow your fuse. So somewhere you've got either a bad socket, um, you, you could have, that. then the other thing is a wiring uh, issue. And, and that's one of the gremlins that you find <clears throat> with a lot of RVs out in, in the industries because you're going from point A wiring all the way to point B, which is at your, your light socket, and there are 20, 30 different spots in there that it could be touching, it could have rubbed, somebody could have run a screw through it. Uh, the first thing that, that I typically do um, when we have some kind of a fuse that's blowing or a circuit breaker or something that's not working is to run a new test wire. Disconnect the wires that you have, pull the socket out, and just see if I take a wire from the uh, fuse box and a negative wire from the battery so I'm taking a positive from the fuse, and I'm taking a negative from the battery, and I'm putting it on the socket. If it doesn't blow then, I know it's not the socket, and it's somewhere along the line in that wiring system. So 
more than likely what's happened is either the wire has rubbed against some, the positive wire has rubbed against something and exposed the wire and that touches to the frame. So now you've got a positive that touches to your negative and it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow that circuit. Uh, again, I would definitely check with the dealership. If it's not under warranty, it's something you want to tackle. The first thing um, that you're going to have to do besides what we just talked about checking stuff is you need to get a wiring diagram. Find out where that wire starts and where it goes through the chassis system and it gets to that turn signal because you're going to have both the front and the back turn signal and you're going to want to check both of those and, and check the wiring. So um, sometimes those are, are hard to find because the wires are concealed in the underbelly or running along the frame rail inside. Um, you know, so it's, it's just a matter of taking the time to, to, to search that stuff. Check with your, your dealer first or even uh, Fleetwood's uh, owner relations department. So then the next question we have is from Andrew. Andrew Yurchuk, uh, can you talk about wheel bearings and RV brake maintenance? And you know, there's, there's two different categories when we look at, at bearings and maintenance. You know, the first one is travel trailers and fifth wheels that are gonna have a different bearing system than what your motorhomes are gonna have. Um, motorhomes basically will have a completely sealed axle anymore. Uh, some of them will have some bearings on the, in the back wheels a little bit like the old style bearings, but most everybody's gone to the completely sealed, um, it, it's a knuckle system, so you really can't get in and, and do any maintenance to the bearings at all. When they start to squeal, you replace that whole assembly. And I've had to do it on a couple of trucks and I know motorhomes that have had to do it. And it's a very expensive piece, but um, well, what they told me when I bought it is that you probably would have had to change bearings and repack bearings about 10 times by the time you had to replace this knuckle uh, in that. So uh, with, with motorhomes, very little you can do with the bearings. Uh, you do want to check the brakes once a year, have a qualified mechanic or yourself if you pull them off, check what the pads look like. A, a telltale sign uh, of brakes starting to wear, other than they, they have a little safety tab, or not safety tab, they have a little wear indicator, that as that pad starts to wear down a little bit, there's this little metal tab that sticks out, and so when it starts to squeal, when the brakes, um, th there's little metal indicators in there, when they start to hit that and you hear them squealing, then that's a good indicator they're starting to get fairly low and that, uh, that it's going to be close to time to re replace those. Also, you'll see a lot of brake dust. Um, it's kind of that brownish, sometimes a little metallic uh, dust that gets on your wheels. You see it on the front mostly because the front's going to be about 75% of your braking uh, capacity in that. So you start to see that around the rim, um, you know, and it gets a little more predominant than then you know that your, your, your brakes are starting to wear down. Now when you get into the travel trailers, one of the things that you, that you really need to do uh, with any RV is get familiar with your owner's manual and the different manuals that, that come with it because here's a classic example. This is a 2007 Jayco. Uh, we worked on the roof of, of this thing last year. It had a, uh, it had a leak in it, and basically ruined the roof, but uh, you have your owner's manual for your RV manufacturer, and that's going to be very generic. Uh, in fact, this one talks about fifth wheels and, and travel trailers, even though this is a little 23-foot um, J feather. Um, it kind of broadly covers, and then it refers to your OEM manuals, which is called uh, Original Equipment Manufacturer, and that's what this book here is. And this is going to be your air conditioner, your Norcold refrigerator, the SureFlow pump, Dexter axles, which it, it, this one has. Now this one does not have the Dexter manual, even though it refers to it several times in there. So somewhere that got taken out over the course of the last 10 or 12 years. But if you look in your owner's manual here, um, this one is a J-Feather and it's got pre-travel information. Now this unit actually has what's called an Easy Lube bearing system. So the bearings are, are just a round bearing that sits inside around the axle um, in, in your hub assembly and as it spins it's going to need to be lubricated. They recommend once a year that you have it checked and repacked by a qualified technician. 
Now that with this easy lube system, you also are able to add grease to this without taking the whole system apart. We did a video on this, check on the site. I think it's been posted recently, but what it is basically is there is a grease zerk right on the outside hub. And don't get confuse it with Bearing Buddies because Bearing Buddies to me is not a, a very good product. It's very messy and, and uh, it, all it does is get your wheel dirty. But what Easy Lube does is it's got the zerk inside and then it'll go all the way through the axle. And I feel like I'm doing a puppet show here. I'm sorry I don't have one, but we did, we did have a sample of one in the video. But it, it actually, um, you know, the way you, you repack grease bear, or wheel bearings typically is you take the assembly all apart, you've got the bearings, and you pull the bearings out, you clean them real good, you wash them up um, with the, the solution and inspect them, and then you pack them with this grease. And it's a long process, it's a dirty process. What the Easy Lube system will do, and there's a couple different versions, that's Dexter has one, I know Lippert has a version very similar, is the Zerk is on the outside and it travels through the tube of the axle with little ports on the back side of the axle before it hits the hub. And when you insert grease into it, it's gonna go in and come out and force the old grease through the bearing, all the corrosion that's in it, all the grit, any dust, any of that stuff, and will push old grease out and you'll start to see kind of the dark colored grease until the pink new stuff comes out and basically kind of cleans it from the inside. Now they do say that this is not in replacement of once a year checking and repacking the bearings. So if you, if you look in your owner's manual, page 49 here talks about the Easy Lube system. Just real quickly, I'm gonna go into here. Easy Lube features on your axle provides ability to bearings periodically lubricate without removing the hub. It's got the Zerk. Um, an operator's manual supplied with the axle OEM, which is Dexter, again, the Easy Lube system must not replace periodic inspection. Now the other thing you can do, and everybody's a little different on their bearings and their axles, but if you go back and you look in your owner's manual, you will find somewhere that they have a storage and maintenance section. And here we have on this one, storage checklist and then maintenance checklist. And every, every manufacturer has one of these. So prior to the trip, you should check all this stuff for the first 200 miles. You should check the wheel nuts at specific intervals for torque values. You, you, those wheel nuts need to have a specific torque from 90 to 125, uh, but you'll have to check with your, your chassis or your axle manufacturer. Um, on a daily, a weekly, a monthly basis, every three months, they say check the wheel nuts at specific interviews. interviews intervals, excuse me. What that does is that makes sure that those nuts on that hub are tightened to the proper tightness on it. Otherwise, you'll start to get warping of that drum. And then when you, you get that drum or the hub starts to warp, then it's gonna, you're gonna get a wobble going down the road. You're gonna have everything heats up faster and you're gonna start to have some problems. So check your wheel nuts at specific intervals. Uh, and then it comes in here every six months. You need to check the, uh, let's see where it's at. Um, actually it's 12 months and it says, have the brakes inspected and serviced by a qualified technician and have the repack the wheel bearings. Just automatically once a year is what they're saying. Now one of the things that, that I, I tell people all the time, we have, I've got a side business it's called Easy Wash. We make a pressure washer that we uh, install in permanently in fast food restaurants and we have over 3,000 units all over the country. I get three trucks and trailers that are on the road 200 plus days a year. Uh, we put about 125 to 150,000 miles per year on those trucks and trailers. When we first bought the company and brought it up here and started running it, we were having a lot of problems with bearings and axles and, and brakes and tires. And a couple things that I found out is the guys were never checking their pressure. They weren't checking the weights that they had in the vehicles. They were taking all the, the units weigh 175 pounds. And if they take six units, then you've got three on one side and three on the other side. And if you take all of them off this side, this side's gonna work a lot harder. So tires are gonna wear faster, brakes, all that kind of stuff. So this is a 
very, very handy piece. I started making our guys take these with it. This is just called a infrared thermometer. And I got this at Harbor Freight for about $12.95. You can find it at home improvement stores. It's a little more pricey than that. You don't need a really fancy version of this. All this does is it shoots an infrared light and it tells me the temperature. This happens to be in, I am 94.1 degrees. So I'm running a little cool, I, th I guess. Uh, but what I do is I have them, every time they stop for fuel, they have a chart. And they get out and they hit the hub in the center. They, they hit the, or the axle, they hit the hub, they hit the bearings area, they hit the tires, and they record that temperature. And I also recommend that, that you do this as well, whether you have a truck and a trailer or motorhome, whatever it happens to be, see what's happening with those bearings. You know, what we found is that when we start to see the temperature shoot up, in any one of those three locations, the axle, the hub, brake drums, uh, tires, uh, and we see that spike, then I know that they're getting dry, that the brakes are probably set up too high, the unit might be way, a little too heavy, but I know there's going to be a problem. Something's going to happen, something's going to break down eventually if I keep letting that temperature go like that. And people will ask me all the time, well, what's, what's, what should the temperature be? It all depends on the outside ambient temperature. If, if you're running at 70 degrees during the day and you stop, and you don't have to do this every single time you stop, but if you just do it kind of during the heat of the day sometime where the sun's up above you when you stop, um, you do that because if the sun's on one side, it's going to be hotter than the other side. But just take a reading. Just see what's, what's happening there. If you're running 70 degree ambient temperature, it's not uncommon for me to see 90 degrees, 95 degrees even if I'm on blacktop sometimes. But if I see it spike up into that 125, the 135 range, wow, I, I know something's wrong. You will save yourself a lot of money and a lot of headaches down the road because it's much easier to get your trailer taken care of when it's not on the side of the road. You know, I see that start to spike up. I'm either going to look at it myself or I'm going to take it in and say, hey, I saw the hubs were running at 135 degrees. Normally, I see them only doing 20 degrees above ambient temperature, so something's going on. Great thing to have. Harbor Freight, uh, Ace Hardware, just about any place you can get it. Very inexpensive, but it's a good tool so you know exactly what's happening in there, and you can, you can address it before it becomes an emergency out on the road. I've changed axles, not me personally, but I've paid to change an entire axle out on the side of the road, and believe me, it is very, very expensive. Okay, so we did one, two. What's uh, the next one? Then comes from guest twenty six forty five. What is the best tire pressure system that you suggest? Uh, there's a lot of really good ones out in the market. Um, I like TST systems. We have done a couple videos on them, but. I've actually tested it myself. I put one of these systems on one of my trucks, uh, trailers actually. The trucks have the tire pressure monitor system. I think they're fantastic to have. This is a good thing to have to see what's going on, but I don't know when that starts to lose pressure when I'm driving down the road. And what I like about the TSTs, they got two different versions. They have one version, uh, both of them go on the end of the um, valve stem. Now. 15 years ago, I wasn't a big fan of those. They were very sensitive. They got dinged a lot uh, going down the road with road debris, and they really didn't last very long. And so I, w I was a little more a fan of the kind that you had to take the tire apart and put the rim ring around the inside of the rim. Very expensive to do that. Uh, these TST, though, I've been very impressed. I, took it, I was given a set to try out. We put it on one of our trucks. Right now I have about 145, 150,000 miles on that truck and it's still registering perfect. I've had no issues uh, whatsoever with the tire pressure monitor, but it has told me a couple times where the temperature was getting kind of hot and where I was losing pressure with it. So it saved me a blowout a few times on, on the road. And the thing that I like about this uh, system is that when my guys go into these places to install this pressure washer system. It's most of the time it's construction areas that have really rough roads, the parking lot's not done. So it's not just a nice smooth interstate driving test with these things. 
they get beat up pretty bad and they have worked like a dream. I, I love them. The two different types, the less expensive type is where you put it on and uh, if you need to add air, you have to take the, the monitor off to add air. The second one is a flow through, it's called. A little more expensive, but it just depends on if you want to take that off or on. And both of them have a little Allen screw that you can tighten down so nobody can steal your monitors. And you can add as many as you want. You know, if, if you, uh, we put a, a system on, a um, friend of mine that we do video production on his, his unit, and he's got a very nice uh, Renegade semi-truck front end uh, motor coach and a hauler behind it. They can haul two cars behind it. And so we put it, we put it on his trailer because his rig already has it. But there's times he wants to haul a boat, he wants to haul something else. So he was able to get some extra monitors and put them on other things without having to swap everything. So you can add a lot of stuff. TST Technologies, uh, check out the store even. I think we might have some in our store um, on the RV Repair Club site. All right. The next one is, is nitrogen fill just a gimmick? If not, how does one fill out on the road or in the campground? Doesn't seem a realistic expectation. Uh, that's a great question. I get that a lot. I uh, spent a lot of time researching tires uh, when I was at Winnebago originally and then with the uh, RV Safety and Education Foundation when they went from just weighing coaches to more tire and safety education, uh, worked with Michelin and Bridgestone. And um, big problem with tires out in the market over the years is that we're not weighing the coaches, we're not checking for proper inflation, and, and we're overloading and underinflating and let them get hot, and we see tire failure all over the country. Nitrogen has become a real hot button. Uh, everybody's you know, gotten on the bandwagon, and, and uh, you know, the, the fact that they say that the nitrogen molecules are larger so they won't pass through the sidewall of the tire and its composition, uh, all that to me is, is just, it, it's a marketing ploy. They, they do nothing for tire inflation, keeping inflation from any of the research that we have seen. I have a good friend here in town that is a tire dealer. He loves nitrogen because he can charge $15 per tire to put nitrogen in. Now, I do have one uh, occasion where I have found a, an advantage of the nitrogen is that when my guys are check, checking on the road, one of the new trailers that we got came filled with nitrogen in the tires. And I noticed that that thing was running about 10 degrees pretty consistently cooler down the road. I looked at the charts, started comparing on, on what's the ambient temperature today, what was this and this and this, and it's like, wow, okay. So if you have a situation where you've, you've got a wheel well, you know, some of your fifth wheels, the wheel well is very, very enclosed, and, and you're going to get a lot of heat that builds up in that area, then I might look at it. Um, and, you know, as far as being able to keep pressure in the tires, no. Um, and you're right, it's hard to find it out in the road. You're, you're seeing more places are doing it now, but... Uh, if you're if you're getting into truck stops or fuel stations just normally down the road uh, you, you know it's it's something you have to get into a service bay to, to do it with so uh, you have to decide now my granddaughter has nitrogen in her tires because her dad loves it he he's one of those firm believers in it it makes her feel comfortable makes her feel more secure you know what I'm all for that so okay is nitrogen. So Sam had a little question here. Please feel free to ask questions. Uh, we do have some more coming in, but anything you've, you've got um, on those uh, would be welcome. Uh, does leaving your jake brake or exhaust brake on, does it hurt anything? Um, I'm not, there, there's several different types of, of exhaust braking systems uh, that are out there and um, I do know that it, it, it I, I don't know of any of the research that actually shows what that back pressure, what, what a Jake brake does is that you're going down the road, a diesel engine has less compression in it that when you let off on the, on the foot feed, a gas engine will have a tendency to kind of give you a little bit because it's got compression. It, it gives you a little braking off the engine itself. A diesel engine pretty much just glides. And so what they've done to, to reduce the amount of brake pad you have to, or braking you have to do on that, 
is they use an exhaust brake and basically they they restrict the flow of the exhaust coming back through and there's different there's different types that's, that's a little generic but you know there's some that are before certain components of the exhaust and back but really what it's doing is trying to create back pressure in the exhaust system and slow that vehicle down but then you're creating pressure inside um, the engine itself I have not personally heard of, of, of any issues of leaving it on um, other than the, you know, I don't know any research of what it does into the engine, that extra compression in there. Um, you know, I, 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 I guess I would imagine that I don't see semis and, and a lot of these cars with the engine exhaust having it on all the time. So to me, it, may, it makes me wonder if there's something that it does do some wear and tear with the engine. I, I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm guessing there. One of the things I do know that, that most of your towns have engine exhaust ordinances um, as you come into town because they don't want that noise. And so you have to look at that. But that's a great question. I will do a little bit of research on that. And hopefully next, uh, next month, if you can rejoin us, we'll, we'll see if we have some uh, more information on that. Uh, David is a 99 Bounder V10 on a Ford. Rough idle, runs great instantly at or above 1,000 RPM. Recent work to replace the EGR valve. Ideas for diagnostics. That, that's, um, that's a very tough one to do without getting in and actually putting you know, some, some meters on. Oxygen sensors are fairly notorious for that stuff. Um, you know, a, a rough idle. Fuel filters, you know, the first thing I would start with is the very basics. I would do the fuel filter. I would do um, the, the uh, spark plugs, um, you know, maybe get it on a scope. Um, you know, there, there are so many components that, that affect the fuel to air mixture in that computer setting that it, it's, it's, uh, it's not an easy question just to say, look at, look at this. You know, it used to be the old days, I, I could get in with a carbureted engine and then clear up into about 1989, 1990. You could say, well, the first thing I would check is the carburetor and the settings and these these certain things. Um, something that you might want to try, and, and this is you know very simple to do, is sea foam is a great product just to put in the gas tank, get in there and clean out some of the carbon. Um, it could be injectors that are are causing a problem. Since yours is uh, 2000. It's a 99 bounder with the V10, so you know there's there's a variety of things that you you can kind of look at, but I would definitely try the sea foam um, or some type of a, an injector cleaner. To me, I think that's the best ones out there. But otherwise, it's really getting in. There's 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 nothing that sticks out in something like that. Okay, um, guess what? How about the cheap $50 tire, tire pressure systems? I. I I'm not. I'm not a big fan of those. Um, you know, you and it's it's like anything else out in the RV industry. You're going to find a ton of people that have used those and love them, and you'll find a ton of people that don't like them. Um, I have just not had much luck. I have talked to a lot of people at the shows that have used them. Um, you know, again, I, the the earlier ones I was not a big fan of, but you know, I would see what kind of guarantee that they have because you're going to put them through some pretty rough times and. You know, you typically anymore get what you pay for. So you start looking at the very inexpensive ones, and and you know they're more designed for people that are going to take short little trips with trailers and and not put very many miles on it. So um, I I would stay away from those. Okay. Is the Moride suspension system good for a fifth wheel dual axle? Is there a better system, or is Moride the best? Um, Moride is, is one of the best ones out in the market. They've been in business, man, I, you know, I started in 1983 at Winnebago, and, and Moride was uh, um, on a lot of the Fleetwood products. Winnebago chose to go a little different direction. They had a jet system and some other things for a while, but no, Mor, Moride has been um, an outstanding product. I think it's a very good suspension system. I think that they, the thing that I like about them is that they are, they're part of the industry, uh, meaning that they they aren't making this for some other application and stepping in and going, oh, hey, we can retro this to the motorhomes and the travel trailers and so forth. They they actually work and research 
and develop and engineer with the RV in mind, not just something and blanket the, the rest of it. Now there are some other great systems um, that are out in the market as well. Um, you know, Dexter has a, a lot of different things as far as suspension wise. I, I've seen uh, several that have come into play with, uh, and I unfortunately I can't think of the name of them right now offhand. They just kind of got into the market in some of the shows that we've been at, but um, I, I think you can't go wrong with Morride. Um, very good company. And, and one of the other things I like about Moride, I guess, is having been through since 1983 up to today, I've gone through several cycles of financial issues, I guess is a kind word. We had the Gulf War at one time. We had gas rationing. We had all kinds of different things where people got out and jumped in. You know, all of a sudden the RV industry starts flying again and all these people come out of the woodwork with products that you've never heard of before, but Moride has weathered all those because they've got a good product, a good um, customer service, and a, and a good reputation, and they last. You have done a video on solar charging. Uh, I would like to perhaps hear some info on a good reputable person or company to discuss my needs. It's hard to find someone to talk to uh, with about this. There are two companies that we have um, done a lot of product, um, not just sponsored videos, but uh, the very first one we did was with um, GoPower, and they sent me um, a solar panel. We installed it on a 2002 Winnebago Brave. It was not a sponsor video for anything. We just wanted content to, to show how easy it was to do, and um, you know, they're an outstanding company. They, they are, um, both, both them and Zamp are probably the one and two, um, and, and they'll argue who's one and who's two, and I won't say which one is either one, because I think they're both great. Uh, I've worked with both of them, but they are both located up in the northwest uh, portion of the United States, one in Vancouver and one up over the, in, in actually Canada. But again, they are very, very well versed in the RV industry. They also do marine and a lot of other stuff, but they have a dedicated group that works with the RV manufacturers, with dealers. Uh, we did the GoPower first. We did a hundred and, I believe it was 120 watt uh, panel that went up on the top of this, this Winnebago. Um, it was, the, the panels have changed considerably. These two are probably the best in the, in the industry as far as durability. Um, they, they have better absorption in an angle, meaning, you know, a lot of times you've got, the sun has to be straight down, you start to get any kind of an angle out of it, and it, it'll kind of bounce uh, and not get into the cell the way it should. They're a lot smaller now, lighter, uh, a lot more powerful, so you don't have to get these massive four foot by six foot and cover the entire top of, of your, your RV. Uh, Zamp is, is the second one, and GoPower, you can, you can get more information on gpelectric.com, and Zamp is zampsolar.com, um, and we did this last run, did the Zamp um, as well. What I really liked about installing both of these is the fact that, um, you know, we put it up on, on the top. It had all the wiring ready to go for the gauge that we were uh, looking to put, the, the size of panel we had, what we were going to charge with. Uh, we, we see a lot of companies now that are actually putting pre-wire for solar panels up on the roof. So you'll see a little label that says pre-wiring here. You don't have to try and fish and snake it down. That's, that's one of the challenges on an existing unit is how do I get that solar panel is up here, but how do I get the wire to my my battery or to the back of my converter which just goes to my battery which we did in the in the brave uh, we were fortunate because we put the unit up on the top we snuck the wire down the vent of the refrigerator which happened to be right there we had a nice cavity on the back side of the refrigerator it's called the flue or the you know what's where the the air exhaust so we could run that down and our converter was right next to the refrigerator so it was an easy hookup the back of the converter, you just go on the positive and negative post because those are going to the battery anyway, and it was it was very easy to do. Otherwise, you know, if you got a travel trailer, you got the batteries up on the tongue. So how do you get up to that? 
I would recommend both companies have a customer service uh, division that will walk through anything. Uh, they have calculators on their website, so if you want to know how big of a converter should I get, or not a converter, excuse me, how big of a solar panel should I get, you know, how many panels do I need? Well, they've got an actual chart that in there that says this is the size of your unit, here's the size of your batteries, here are the components I want to run, I want to run my, um, you know, I just want to charge my batteries to be able to run my interior lights and stuff, or do you have an inverter that you're going to do your refrigerator and a TV and some outlets, a coffee pot? Those things are all going to drain your batteries down a lot faster. You're going to have to have a bigger um, solar panel system to help rejuvenate that or recharge it. But all that stuff will, will help walk you through what size do I need. And probably the biggest thing on solar panels um, is understanding your battery capacity. You know, what size battery do you, do you have now? If it's a group 24 battery, you are not going to be happy trying to do any type of dry camping and solar power because you just you don't have enough storage in that battery. You know, go to group 27, go to two batteries. Um, 6 volt versus 12 volt, that is an age old argument. Going to 6 volt batteries doesn't give you any more battery power, any more amp hours. It, what it does is it gives you more cycles. You have more plates. Um, so if I take two 6 volt batteries that are a group 27 and they have 100 and let's say 170, 180 amp hours. If I add those two group, those two six volts together, I have to hook them positive to negative because I am still got to have a 12 volt bank even though you're running six volt, it's 12 volts. So you have to have two or four or six. I can't have three. I have to have two at a time. So I add those two batteries together. It does not give me two times 180 amps it gives me 180. If I take a 12 volt battery that's 180 amps and I put a second 12 volt battery parallel, positive to positive, that still gives me 12 volts but it doubles my amp hours. The reason people go with the 6 volt, the, the manufacturers, is that that will last a lot more cycles. So if I'm going to do a lot of dry camping and I want those batteries to last a long, long time, those 6 volt stay charged a lot longer. Now the other thing that you have to be concerned about battery power is sulfation. If you don't have a multi-stage charger in that or AGM batteries, they will sulfate. And lead acid batteries, I would say right now with, without having a, an inverter that does the multi-stage charger, just having a standard converter charger, about 80% of the lead acid batteries on the market are sulfated. They last two to three years and I get no storage out of them. They should last five to seven. So understand your batteries. Contact the, the company. I'm, I'm spending a little more time on this than probably the others want to do, but that's a, that's a huge problem with batteries, and no matter what you do is the sulfation of them and taking care of them, understanding your batteries. All right. Um, let me get back up here. i got a whole bunch of... Where do you jack up a travel trailer, on the frame or the axle? I have a Palomino 2016 solitaire travel trailer dealer said not to jack it up in the frame but on the axle. The axle manufacturer Dexter says not to jack it up on the axle. That is, that is an age-old battle as well and if you refer to your owner's manual I'm going to look at this one here hitch brakes uh, towing trailer frame 48. I wonder if that'll have anything on there about that. Uh, towing and handling camping Let's see what 48 says. Yeah, nothing in here about it. Most of the time, your axle manufacturers don't recommend jacking the trailer up with the axle. It all depends on the weight of the trailer uh, as well. But what happens is if you put that jack onto the axle itself and you pull it up, you have, a, you have the potential of bending that axle with, with the weight that, that's on there. You also don't have a very good solid frame or, or jacking point because the axle is going to be round. Um, some of the axle manufacturers will let you put it on the harness or the bracket of the axle, but again, you have run the risk of bending that. So it, it's, it's a little frustrating sometimes, like in your situation where the motorhome company says don't use the frame or the travel trailer 
and the axle company says don't use the axle. Well, they're both just trying to, you know, cover themselves from a warranty issue where you jack something up and you bend the bracket or you, you get on a portion of the frame. Most of your manufacturers like Jayco will have points on their frame that they say, here's where I want you to jack it up. Um, you know, typically the closer you can get towards the front and the A-frame, but you got wheels that are halfway back. So that's why you're jacking up, trying to get to, to those wheels. So um, there's not a really good answer in that and without getting somebody in technical service or customer service at the manufacturer because what you're gonna what you're gonna find is they're gonna say don't use the frame because if if they don't get you in the exact spot um, you could do some damage again to places that are not really rigid to hold the weight um, so what I would recommend doing is and I wonder if we can 2016 Palomino and we'll do a little bit of research on that. Just check in your owner's manual and see if there's any place in there that refers to um, lift points. I'm just doing a real quick here to see if there was anything electrical, occupy, storage, maintenance, maintenance. What do we got here? Roof. Well, I don't. I don't see it, and I don't want to waste a lot of. Uh, wait a minute here. Towing and handling. Towing, stabilizing, emergency towing, emergency stopping. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't give a lot about tow vehicle, trailer frame. Yeah. So, anyway, sorry I couldn't be more specific, but uh, let's see if we can't get a hold of somebody at the Palomino or the dealership because somebody's got to have an answer. You got to be able to jack that thing up and uh, be able to change your tires. All right, so we are at 741. How long does a deep cycle battery hold a charge? Going primitive camping and have to turn my generator off at in the evening. I have a Keystone hideout 298 bed AES with one new battery. Um, I would say with one new battery in that unit, you'll be lucky to get a day out of, out of that thing. And again, it goes back to the fact, first of all, we don't, we don't know what size battery you have. It's a, if it's a group 24, you have about 120 amp hours, which means you, you have barely a day that will last with a lot of the stuff that, that's in there. You might want to go up to a, a, a second, and you want to match batteries exactly to what you have. So you want to go to a second group 24 or go to two group 27 batteries, which is going to give you a lot more capacity without having to start your generator um, and, and recharge those batteries. Um, another thing you might want to look at is solar panels. It's a kind of an inexpensive option to help recharge those, um, and they do have a multi-stage charge, which is the second thing, is what condition are those batteries in? That's an impossible question to ask, answer. Um, without knowing, number one, what size battery do you have? What are the amp hours? Number two, what condition is it in? Is it at 100% storage capacity or has it sulfated? And that's very, very difficult to, to determine without charging that battery and putting a 25 amp load on it and seeing how many hours it goes. And that's not something you, you find very often. And the third thing is, is what are you using inside? Because the different components, the more you use your lights inside. And it's halogen lights versus incandescent lights versus LEDs. You know, your, your incandescent lights are going to take 10 times more battery power than your LEDs. And how many of them do you have on? You know, are you running your refrigerator off of the uh, inverter on 120 through the batteries? That's going to drain it really fast. So uh, you, you have to kind of look through and see, you know, what am I using, first of all? Um, how often am I using it? How long during the day? Um, you know, if it's just using a refrigerator, but, but then you've got to remember if you're using a, a furnace, and, you know, at this time of year you probably won't, but it still dips down into some cold temperatures in, in the evening in some of the places, especially the mountains, that furnace is going to pull a lot of battery power not only with the flame and the spark igniter and everything involved in that, but the motor is going to run the fan, and that's going to drain it um, a lot faster. So, uh, again, you know, rule of thumb, one battery, group 24, 
you won't be very happy with it. Um, I would start looking at, a, at adding a little more to it. Uh, talk to Trojan, talk to Lifeline, talk to US Battery, uh, and that's, that's another thing too is what type of battery is it. Um, those are the really good ones that you see most of the manufacturers use that are going to last. Your cut rate batteries that you get out of um, some of the home improvement stores and, and discount club stores are not going to last. Um, they have very thin plates and the storage in them is next to nothing. Okay. I've been reading uh, about lithium ion coach batteries. Can you just direct swap them into your RV or will you need to change chargers or solar system equipment? Most of the time you're going to have to change the charger with it because they, they won't be equipped for that type of a battery. Um, most of your solar systems now, if they have a charge controller on it, um, they're, they're capable of, of charging the lithium ion batteries. One of the things you want to be very careful, they're very, very expensive, but they are also very susceptible to cold weather. If you're going to get them into any kind of freezing temperatures, um, they are just having a lot of problems with those units. I've been talking to uh, several of the people at Winnebago Industries because the, you know, the hot button right now is the little Class Bs, the Mercedes and the, the um, Ford Transits and stuff that are going out and, and being the eco um, type deal where they've got the solar panels and the lithium ion batteries and you can go out and dry camp with no generator and run your roof air conditioner off the inverter on those lithium ion batteries for about three hours but you get them into any cold situations, in the freezing situations, those batteries are very, very susceptible to cold weather and, and they're failing. So make sure you do some research, look at the areas you're at, talk to some of the manufacturers. Um, they are coming out with some new technology now on, on the, the batteries themselves, but they're still not quite the, you know, the best thing in all situations. Okay. So I got a question here. Are battle-borne batteries worth the investment? Also installing a solar charging system, which would you recommend? Well, first of all, I have to say I'm not familiar with battle-borne batteries. I, I guess I'm, um, yeah, and one of the things I, I learn on a daily basis is I, I don't know everything. Um, I've been in this business since 1983, and I've, I've learned to never say never. Um, few times at Winnebago when we said, no, that but they never used this, and all of a sudden you kind of look up, and for some reason so somebody didn't change the documentation, and they did use this product, and you're like, okay, that's, that's new. Uh, you know, there are literally thousands of products jumping into the market on a daily basis, and, and uh, you know, so I will do some research on the, on the Battleborn, Battleborn, is that right? Battleborn batteries. So I've Again, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, as far as the solar system, solar panel system, Go Power, GPElectric.com, and Zamp, both of those are outstanding products. Um, one of the things that we didn't, I didn't mention about beforehand when we were talking about solar is you might also want to look at the portable systems. They have suitcases uh, that you can take with you, and you hook it to the side port. You put it, you'd have to put a side port or go directly to the battery itself. Uh, you can't use those when you're traveling down the road. That's one disadvantage. And some people like to use a combination of both, you know, a couple of the roof panels and a couple of the portables because it, when you're, you're using solar, you have to have direct sunlight. You can't be in the shade. You can't be under a tree, canopy, or anything like that. So now all of a sudden you're taking an RV and you're putting it out in direct sunlight so that you can get some charging capacity out of it but you're going you're gonna to raise the temperature of that rig sometimes 20, 30 degrees just because you're out in the sun. I like to have it in the shade. So best of both worlds is to have panels on the roof that I can get some charging capacity when I'm going down the road and I have the sun here, and portables where I can put the unit underneath the trees for shade, keep it cool, and then put my portables out in the sun so I get the charging capacity but I get the cooler temperatures. Uh, also with line of sight and um, uh, the angle. You know, you still have only about three hours of good sunlight that's going to charge you because of the angles. You start getting it, you know, 10 o'clock and 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, you know, those angles this, this far out, 
then you're going to have a real, uh, real issue getting that to hit those cells properly and to convert that into charging power. Now I can take and I can angle my suitcases. They have they, they actually fold up, real easy carrying case. Uh, you unfold them. They got legs. I can angle them at any direction I want, so I can get that in the sun and I can get them out. And both Samp and Go Power have those. So take a look at those. Uh, somebody said thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, we have, is Dicor 501 sealant okay to use to seal a max air fan on a fiberglass roof? I believe it is. I, um, well, you would, and, I, and I don't know what the 501, I know Dicor has specific um, sealants that are used for product, and that's one of the things you definitely need to find out. Do you have TPO? Do you have... Uh, EPDM, do you have alpha system? All three of those are the rubber membranes, flexible stuff, uh, and fiberglass. Not everything can be used on, on fiber, fiberglass. Not everything can be used on those alpha systems. Um, I'm, Winnebago has uh, proprietary sealants that, that they have sold that are specifically for the, uh, the fiberglass. They have some that are specifically for plastic. In fact, they they make a sealant chart that shows what is recommended for every specific area. So if you've got a fiberglass roof, I'm assuming you probably have a Winnebago or a higher line in the Fleetwood uh, product lineup. And, and uh, um, you know what? I think if I can do a real quick, just open a new window. If, as my granddaughter say, if only there was a way we can find out. So I'm going to go to Dicor. Dicor.com and their products. For RV. They don't have a search feature on here, which I wish they did. Rudy is always on there. Rudy's got some great videos, does a wonderful job with information. Dicor has some fantastic products. We, we send people there a lot of the stuff they have here. And I do not see, let's Google and see if I can get there faster. I don't want to waste everybody's time. And it is a lap sealant, so that means it's, it's going to be a self-leveling. So now on Dicor, it shows it's for EPDM, but some of these are yeah, compatible with EPDM and TPO. So I would, I would say we would want to probably get a little bit Dicor sealant for fiberglass. And what do they have here? Go ahead, get off of there. RV maintenance, easy, flexible. Let's see more product information. So now they have one here that's a 501 LSD-1 self-leveling. Let's just see what this says on. So the lap ceiling, skylights, TV antennas, where a non-leveling ceiling is desired, dub white, and it does not specify. I would do a little bit of more, a little bit more research on on that product. Uh, it, it looked like originally it was EPDM and TPO, which is a rubber membrane. And uh, I don't see the roof coating stuff. So we'll have to do a little bit more research. But I would be a little bit leery of using that on the fiberglass until I knew for certain it said on the fiberglass. And Dicor is a good company just to give them a call and say, here's what I got. I got a fiberglass roof. 
um, and, and hopefully by next next uh, time we do this, I can dig that up and, and find it. So, um, all right, where did my RB Repair Club? Do you have any recommendations for tire rotation on Class C motorhomes, like front to inside rear, inside rear to outside? outside rear to front would you swap sides and or change tire rotation uh, tire rotation direction um, so most of your RV your motorhome manufacturers do not recommend uh, tire rotation they don't have a, a pre-designed rotation pattern that you're doing they basically say that if you start to see wear that you could move the tire but more importantly check the weight of it now, it kind of depends on uh, you said on a Class C. Now, some of the smaller Class Cs, like the Mercedes, do have a tire rotation, and, and they're all different. So, what you need to get is the chassis manufacturer, whether it's Chevrolet, Mercedes, um, a few Chevys are out in the market on the smaller little Cs, but you know, mostly you're going to see the Ford and the E uh, cutaway chassis, and uh, um, they they. The smaller ones do. I, I, most of your Class Cs with the duals in the back don't don't have a tire rotation pattern. But it will be in the chassis manufacturer, and it will show you which way you can. Now you can change the actual rotation. You know, if you have some on the passengers or driver's side here, and they're wearing to the inside, and you want to get a little more life out of them, you can actually change them around to the other rotation, um, and literally change the tire on the. Um, on the rim itself, uh, you, in the past you couldn't do that. It had steel belts, and that would make the belt slip, and that's the old adage. But anymore, that 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 technology has advanced so that it, it does not happen. Um, so we don't have that problem. But I definitely check with your tire, with your chassis manufacturer, and it will give you the pattern for which way they recommend. Most of it's just a, it's around. The unit, not the not the crisscross as much anymore like it used to be, but just moving them around to get different rotations. What is the best way to repair delamination on an RV? Um, okay, William just came back. Tire rotations on E three fifty four twenty four class C. Um, so then then you would have. Uh, I think they do have a recommendation on a smaller, like the E350. Everything else has gone up to the E450s and, and higher on larger stuff. So check with your chassis manufacturer on, on that one. Right in your book, you should have a Chevy chassis um, in, your, in your OEM. And if you go through that and you just check and look, you'll see a diagram that says driver's side front to driver's side rear and so forth. And uh, some of them recommend rotating a spare within that others don't so again it's you have to check that what is the best way to repair delamination in an RV um, well what what causes delamination in an RV is is almost always moisture penetration in there so somewhere you've got a window that's leaked you've got a roof that's leak um, roof to sidewall joint air conditioning shroud area that uh, gasket wasn't sealed um, you know, so you got moisture that comes in, and the way the the sidewall is manufactured is you've got your interior paneling, you've got uh, Luon backing sometimes with that block foam insulation or loose fill, depending on the type of coach you have. The frame can be either aluminum or wood framing, and then you've got Luon outer skin, and the farther farthest outer skin is fiberglass and all that has adhesive in every step of that process so they lay down the interior first and the, the, the pile it up and they spray on the adhesive and then they either vacuum bond it which is a, a uh, vacuum sucking it out and applying pressure basically they're squeezing it Winnebago pinch rolls there through a roller and if you get moisture that gets in between those layers it'll start to loosen up that foam or that, that adhesive and they will start to separate. That's delamination, it'll start to bubble. Now sometimes it gets so bad that it even, even completely eats out the uh, insulation and um, the Luon backing gets rotten. And so it really depends on the level of delamination. Now there are some processes that uh, you can do if it's not too bad where you, you can try to get 
in wherever your delamination starts. Put some, uh, some adhesive glue in there. You'd have to check with a body company to find out what is best for um, the putting in between the, the layers of insulation and luon and fiberglass. You can't use just any kind of adhesive. Some of that stuff will di completely disintegrate block foam, styrofoam. And then I have seen where they apply pressure to the sidewall, where they put a great big sheet of plywood and a two by four with a jack against the post in the building. Um, you know, it, it's it's not a very easy procedure. It, uh, the, the, but the only way to really do it properly is to tear that sidewall material out where that damage is at and find out what's in there and put new materials and new stuff and then, and then uh, adhesive in each layer and then go in and do a fiberglass repair and that's very expensive delamination is not an easy fix okay and we have about eight o'clock we're pretty close here looks like that was the last question uh, William I will check on that uh, class C and uh, it is eight is it ready to we took the last question I appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, we had a lot of really good questions, some of them kind of tough. And like I say, I, I find something new all the time uh, as I go through this. And, and uh, I keep learning, which is great. And I will, I will dig into some of these questions and, and see if we can have some answers for you uh, by next time. Also go on, on our, online on the Facebook page and other social media stuff. You can post that question. And either myself or Dan, we've got a couple other technicians that were where uh, as questions are starting to build up that are, are researching this stuff and we will find it for you. Appreciate you coming out. Have a great evening and uh, enjoy your camping and have a great 4th of July and a safe 4th of July. I'm going to find that Dicor one. That's what I'm going to go right now. <laughs>